This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider interview. The subject is the yard birds. I'll be talking with Matt Williamson about it, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Matt Williamson is my guest. We'll be talking about the classic UK band, the Yardbirds. Matt has appeared once before. Uh, for those who don't know him, he runs a website called Pop Goes the Sixties. I think it's also a uh, also a YouTube channel and and a website, right? Well, it's a YouTube channel first and foremost. I'm just beginning my website. Just started the website just now, so that's getting underway. Well, uh, other than the website, if you want to give a little bit of background about yourself as a musical historian, the whys and wheres, and why did you focus on the 60s rather than the 50s or the 70s or the 80s? Well, uh, as Dan said, um, I run the Pop Goes the 60s, and I've always been a fan of 60s music. I came up, I'm a second-generation Beatle fan, so I mostly grew up in the 70s and 80s. But for some reason, the 60s always was my go-to music. That's what I had around. That's what I was brought up on. And I never have been able to shake it. So when I started to do a, when I decided to do a YouTube channel, I wanted to focus on 60s music and really get more in-depth history of the bands, some popular bands as well as obscure bands. But I wanted to also play some music uh, on the channel so that people could hear what we're talking about. It's not easy to play music on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten around it in a couple different ways with very short segments. And that way people can hear the hits and they can hear the, the very excellent deep cuts as well, which makes some good bands great. Uh, and just to, so people know, it's it's 90 plus percent rock. It's not, uh, it's not Motown, it's not jazz, but uh, I think that I've seen one or two videos that were non-rock. Yeah, I would say it's, it encompasses anything in the 60s musically. I have done some some folk stuff, but generally it is rock. It's pretty heavily uh, Beatle-focused. But, um, yeah, like, for example, I just finished up a, I'm finishing up a big series on the Beach Boys. And surprisingly, uh, this I did, I'm on my fifth segment, and it's pretty in-depth. And I, the, the reception has been good, but not like when I'm doing a band like Cream. Or the Yardbirds, yeah. those who draw more. Well, uh, let me just open up, since you mentioned the Beatles. Uh, there's always been a bit of a controversy in the 1960s as to which band, which song, which recording was the first to use the sitar in rock music. And most people uh, would say that it was the Beatles. Uh, others say that uh, it was the Yardbirds. Uh, and I think technically they were, although uh, on For Your Love, I believe it was, uh, the, the singles version actually was a guitar that was mimicking a sitar. Uh, so who, who actually was the first to use the sitar? The Beatles, the Yardbirds, or someone else? Well, I, my notes tell me it is the Yardbirds. Uh -huh. uh, and they recorded um, the song Heart Full of Soul with a sitar originally, but it didn't work. Mm. So they switched. So Beck came up with that guitar part, which was perfect. Oh, shit. I just spilled my water. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Harry. I made a mess. Um, so, sorry about that. No but, yes, indeed, Beck came up with such a good and strong guitar part that uh, they removed the sitar entirely. So that went in the can, and the Beatles came out with Norwegian Wood um, several months later. Now, uh, in preparing for this, um, I know that... Uh, uh, I was trying to think of American bands that were uh, the foster, the, the the loam from which other bands sprung from, because the Yardbirds are famously uh, known as, uh, you know, there's Beck, Clapton, Page, you have Led Zeppelin, you had Cream, you had uh, Jeff Beck Group, and uh, a few other iterations uh, of, of bands that those three main guitarists and a few of the, the, the lesser known uh, uh, members of the band went through. And the only band that came to mind was the Buffalo Springfield as maybe having a, a similar uh, lineage uh, of birthing other bands. Um, what was it about the Yardbirds uh, that uh, made them such a, a hotbed for future music? Well, I guess the British blues boom really took hold, hold in the clubs in London. And that just grew into something more progressive that became, I guess, the psychedelic period. And then after that, that kind of grew into the hard rock period. And the, the lead guitar became the instrument. 
And I think the, the, the British players had a leg up on the American players because they were more based in blues. And that's why we saw, I think, so many great guitar players come out of, out of England uh, during that time. Uh, in America, the roots were more in folk. So a group like the Buffalo Springfield, definitely folk roots by both Neil Young, Richie Fure, and Stephen Stills. So, uh, and that's why they, they got to the country part of it of uh, the late 60s more quicker than the Brits did. Um, so that's, I think, uh, that's my explanation anyway. So what was the original lineup of the Yardbirds and how did they get together? Well, the original lineup had um, a singer named Keith Ralph. Uh, the guitar player was a guy named Anthony Top Topham, who was really young, he was a teenager. Chris Dre on rhythm guitar, Paul Samuel Smith on bass, and Jim McCarty on drums. Now, Topham was a very fine player, but he was so young, his parents wanted him to go to school, so that's when Clapton came in. So Clapton was a little bit of the odd man out initially, because the others had been together for a while. So uh, he wasn't as, uh, didn't hang out with the other four as much. So what, what was, uh, what, what was sort of the uh, background of uh, uh, Clapton? Because famously, you know, uh, uh, the skiffle background of Jimmy Page, uh, uh, Jeff Beck was famously uh, blues influence. Where did uh, where did Clapton come from uh, in terms of influences on him? You know, I I don't have real specifics on that. Obviously, he loved the blues. I'm not. I don't remember the actual players he was into, but he. That was his passion. And the Yardbirds, once they got going, the Beatles hit, everybody wanted to have hits. The Yardbirds were trying to have hits with blues songs, which wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's how, when they basically changed their sound, Clapton was out because he was such a blues purist. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that, that's interesting. We'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about the discography of the band uh, in a bit. I've always found it interesting how... Uh, uh, such a pure as supposedly Clapton was, yet if you look back now with 50 years, uh, he seems to have, for me at least, uh, strayed the most from the blues. Jeff Beck seems to have been the one who had the most fealty to the blues. Um, you know, it was, it was in the 90s with the, the song about his, his child that died. Uh, uh, and even going back to things in the 70s with like I Shot the Sheriff, he seemed to, to all of a sudden become, you know, a light rock staple in the 70s or so. Cocaine. Well, I think um, everybody got went away from the blues. I mean, if you wanted to be popular, you, you had to leave the straight blues behind. And both Page and Beck did that. And um, I think it was just a natural progression. You know, Cream went away from the blues on that second album, Embrace Psychedelia. Hmm. And after that, you know, you had the hard rock sound that launched the Zeppelin types. But it, it was, I don't know, Clapton, you're right. I mean, he, if you wanted to roll, you had to expand beyond the blues, which he eventually did. And and with songs like uh, Train Kept the Rolling and Stroll On, uh, that, that I would, I guess, be considered the early period. Um, it was when they tried to do, like, uh, Shapes of Things and, and uh, that. I mean, where, at what point did they change management? Uh, what what? What prodded them to go for the more, you know, singles, the 45s? Well, I think part of the reason was is they, were, they, they weren't really songwriters. And that was a problem for this group because when Lana McCartney started writing out all those great hits, it inspired many people to write. So the Yardbirds, once Eric Clapton left, because they started to go in a more poppy direction, and Jeff Beck came in. Beck was just the right guitar player to get more progressive. And the Yardbirds, I mean, the, the, their greatest moment, I would say, is Shapes of Things. Mm. And that's a, a song they wrote. It's a darn near perfect song. And it's a, an incredible piece of psychedelia for its time. I mean, it's probably the first psychedelic track on Popways. I think that's like March of 66. So I think that things were just kind of happening around them, and in that particular case, they were able to harness it. Not so all the time. All, they weren't able to really replicate that hit uh, a little bit, but not quite. You mentioned uh, uh, Top Topham not being able to uh, 
go on with the band. Um, was there any uh, like incipient uh, dissension in the band? Because it, as they went through members, especially with the guitarist, uh, uh, you know, did what what were the internal politics within the band uh, in terms of because i know i know that i've read over the years that you know uh once uh once beck had uh, i'm sorry once clapton had gone you know beck wanted to go uh in one direction and someone like ralph wanted to go in another direction um so what where did where did was the band just in terms of creativity you said they weren't songwriters so yeah, well, when when Clapton left, which was basically the dawn of 1965, um, the, the band wanted to have hits, so they were hooked up with a songwriter, Graham Gouldman, from uh, the Mockingbirds, and he provided them with For Your Love. Now, this was the first part of the band where you, know, you really had a dissension in the ranks with style of music. So Clapton didn't want to go in the pop direction, so that's why he left. Now, once they went into the pop direction, they wanted to stay in that pop direction, but they had a hard time following up. They, they did do a great follow-up single, Heartful of Soul, and, uh, but they struggled uh, to remain relevant in the pop world when all these other great pop uh, bands were around. Yeah, they, they had a, a sound initially, just looking at some of the tracks there, um, I, I, Putty in Your Hand, uh, uh, I Ain't Done Wrong, I wish I wish you would, which I think is a, a really good song. Uh, uh, good morning, little schoolgirl. They were cover. They did some covers, but they were very much in. I guess it, a few years later, they were doing songs that a group like the Hollies would probably get blasted for uh, sometimes for being too pop oriented. They were only like two minute songs. Um, they weren't as as raw, for example, in sound as the Kinks were at that point. Um, uh, they 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 seem sort of directionless. Uh, they they could go in any different direction. Uh, what sort of was was what sort of stabilizing? Because the next album that comes out is is Roger the Engineer, and that's that's generally considered their top album, and it's a fantastic album. Yeah, that album. I'm surprised people consider that their top album. Um, I think that um, in America, obviously, their albums were chopped up a bit, like the Beatles albums were. So you don't have, they don't, they're not known as an album band. And Roger the Engineer, which is also known as a self-titled album called The Yardbirds, yeah. it's all, they wrote the entire thing. And as I said, they weren't really writers. And I think this album bears that out. I don't think this is a strong album. And I'm always surprised when people say it's the best. I mean, I think there's a lot of weak tracks on here. Um, because they aren't writers, and they only had five days to record it, so they didn't really weren't given the time to even do a, a really nice job on it. There's very little overdubbing, and uh, you know they did come up with the song "Over Under Sideways Down," which was the hit off of it, which is a very good song. But generally speaking, I think it's it's a weaker album, and that's when they started to try to bring in a, a producer to produce them because they produced that <clears throat> themselves, I believe. And uh, the label insisted they bring in a, a producer, and that's where they run afoul, where they were stuck with Mickey Most, a producer who was a pop producer, and wasn't really going to lead them in the direction of a progressive rock band. So uh, around this time, that was that the time that they made their uh, appearance in the film uh, Blow Up, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni? Because I think they did stroll on uh, during that scene. Yeah, that's one really, I thought that was a good step for them. They appeared in a very, very fine film. There was a, a Swing in London film that gave them some street cred. They were in a club scene where they played a, one of the old blues standards. And uh, that was the last moment where you had both Paige and Beck in the band. And uh, we were very lucky to see them both together on film. Now, uh, that that uh, appearance, like I said, was the last of that. Uh, uh, when, uh, but if we step back, when did and why did uh, Jimmy Page come in? Because at that time, uh, Page was uh, basically a, a session player, uh, as were, were was John Paul Jones, who was also uh, later became uh, the New Yardbird, uh, the New Yardbirds, and uh, uh, 
So how, how did how did he get recruited into the band? Because at one point you had basically dueling lead guitarists in Page and Beck. Yeah, so once Clapton left, the first person they did approach was Jimmy Page. And Page was known to them. You know, he was already doing a lot of sessions at the time. And he declined, I think because he was making good money and wasn't really ready to, do, to go on the road. And he suggested his friend Jeff Beck. So Beck and Page grew up together. And that's how Jeff Beck got into the band. Now, that was in early 65. So they really started to make a mark with Beck. When they came to the States, it was with Jeff Beck. And that's when they did uh, 40, uh, Heart, Heart Full of Soul, Mr. You're a Better Man Than I, and then eventually Shapes of Things. So the bass player, Paul Samuel Smith, he, was, he always wanted to be a producer. He was weird, getting tired of the road. Like a lot of bands, they were doing these horrible tours. They weren't making a lot of money. They weren't, making, they weren't having huge hits. And he decided to quit. So they just decided to bring in Jimmy Page. And initially, he did join them on bass. And the idea was for the rhythm guitar player, Chris Drea, to move to bass so Beck and Page could play twin lead guitar. And this was a great idea. And unfortunately, it didn't really work because a couple things. By the time Page joined the band, Jeff Beck was burning out. And they were only able to record a few songs together and appear in that film. And Beck ended up, he left the band briefly, came back, and then they, event, they fired him because he was just unre unreliable. He was sick, he had tonsillitis, and like a lot of young guys that are on the road so much, you get worn down. So that's why Beck left the band. I think it's too bad because had they had the right management to really uh, mentor them and really... Uh, groom them, you know, in the studio and on the road, that would have been an absolutely devastating lineup going into 67 and 68. But they didn't have that kind of leadership or management, and it fell apart. Um, it's, it's interesting because when you, as we're talking here, it seems that not much went right for the band during the times that they were together, yet they have, over the next 50, 60 years, uh, their, their legend uh, as music, musicians has only grown. Um, what do you think accounts, uh, other than obvious quality uh, of, of the, of the uh, talent of the, the band members, what do you think accounts for the fact that they had so little cohesion and success, really, uh, when they were in their prime, and yet they'll look back as sort of uh, this, you know, ever-growing, you know, source of uh, creativity and, and, and so many uh, future guitarists and, and other bands would cite the Yardbirds as influences. Yeah, I would say, you know, what you just said about, you know, all these years later we look back and how well regarded the Yardbirds are. And uh, I think that's true for probably 95% of all 60s bands. I mean, they didn't, nobody made money or much money unless you had publishing. And all these years later, we have all these people, you know, we're talking about them now. In the case of the Yardbirds, because of those three guitar players that got so huge in the 70s and beyond, uh, that, made, that gave the Yardbirds so much more attention than they probably deserved to get. Mm. Because they're not, if you look at their music, I mean, they're more like if you, if you chart, they didn't have as many hits as the Animals. And they weren't really as good because if you look at compare them to the Kinks, they had the Kinks had a great songwriter, and um, the Yardbirds might be overrated because of the all the fame that came to Jimmy Page via Led Zeppelin and Clapton, and then obviously Beck. Beck was a, probably the least got the least fanfare of the three, but maybe is the best guitarist of the three of them. Mm. But I think that that's the reason. It's, it's you know the guitar the guitar hero became God, and this one band had three of them in it. So it's always been a, a, a historical effort to figure out what happened. Why didn't they stay together longer? Why didn't they do more together? So I think that's one of the reasons. Well, also I I would think too. Um, while none of the albums are say cohesive the way Rubber Soul was or the way some of the Stone stuff was, or some of the later album-oriented rock of the 70s uh, was, um, they had a, a lot of really uh, great songs. Um, 
uh, I, I think, like happenings 10 years time ago. Um, and, and a lot of it, I think, presages what would become, uh, uh, in the late 70s, uh, uh, punk, but also obviously heading into uh, uh, Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple when they became, I mean, it's undeniable, I think, that, that when you listen to some of uh, uh, just the, the, the daring in some of the songs, even the stuff that doesn't work, um, that, that I think they would, they would attract younger uh, musicians if, if only by how daring they were in, in many ways. Yeah, I think that some of the tracks, like you mentioned, happened 10 years time ago. That's a groundbreaking psychedelic track that is very, um, it's not that commercial, but it actually charted pretty well in the States. Mm. And a lot of guitar players were inspired by that. And I think the guitar was just getting louder and heavier. And they turned to the Yardbirds because the Yardbirds were playing louder and heavier before really anybody else was, uh, at least on the pop charts anyway. So I th and the Yardbirds, when they toured America, they were very popular. They weren't selling a ton of records, but as a live, uh, a live unit, they were quite popular, particularly because of the song Shapes of Things. Now, remember, they came out in early 66. Well, when they started touring in the summer of 66, they were in San Francisco, and the San Francisco hippies viewed them as some kind of like hippie band with that song Shapes of Things because it was so psychedelic. So they kind of were thrust into the psychedelic scene without really intending for that to happen. So I think that helped them. Mm. Yeah, um, I don't know, have you ever listened to the album Easter Everywhere by uh, the 13th Floor Elevators, uh, Rocky yeah. Erickson? Yeah, I I think that came out in early 67 maybe. Um, and to me, it uh, we haven't talked about the album Little Games, but from, from, from when you go from Roger the Engineer to Little Games, Easter everywhere, somewhere right in that that same kind of mix, and I, I you know, Rocky Erickson had a better voice than Keith Ralph, at least a, a a fiercer voice, but he has that same kind of growl that uh, uh, Ralph brought to the songs. Yeah, that's interesting. You bring that album up. Uh, to me, Roger the Engineer, which came out, uh, boy, I think late summer '66, maybe fall, and then Little Games, which was later '67. There's a lot of time in between there where I wish they would have done another album with you know both Page and Beck. That would have been the album. So that would have been the period where they had done Happenings 10 Years Time Ago. So they just didn't have the time together that they needed to really produce what we hoped they would have done. Mm. Um, in a sense, uh, earlier this year when I first spoke to you, I talked about the group The Naz, which was uh, Todd Rundgren's band. They're almost opposite of the Naz in that uh, the Naz uh, had really terrible management uh, but they uh, but they had uh, a couple of albums that uh, that had potential on, on the other hand you have a far more accomplished band in terms of musically uh, and yet yet things never generally coherent I mean I guess you could say that for most bands in the 60s because I, th I think in the first show we spoke about most bands in the 60s usually had a couple of albums if they were lucky and then they sort of faded away um, uh, when I think of a, a group like the zombies uh, they're another uh, group that seem to have a, a lot of, of great stuff and a lot of great material and, and a lot of talent that it never seemed to gel for them but because they didn't have the influence they're kind of they were more pop rather than rock and so you know they didn't they didn't have that that same kind of influence in the next decade that the yardbirds did yeah for sure so the the zombies get thrown in the same bag today that we speak of we talk about pet sounds of the beach boys it's pop it's this more sophisticated pop so that was not going to be the wave of rock music in 1967 because we know that the future was the Led Zeppelin, and uh, that's where all the money was. That's where all the stadium tours were. It was Zeppelin. Yeah. It wasn't uh, the Zombies or, um, you know, Pet Sounds. So let's talk about what precipitated the breakup of the band. And before we talk about, you know, I mean, we'll talk certainly about Clapton, Beck, and Page post 
uh, Yardbirds. But what about the the other fellows? Um, Keith Ralph eventually died. Was was he electrocuted uh, or, or something? Uh... Yeah, he was electrocuted by a microphone in his own home, and was, that was I believe in nineteen seventy six. Okay. So he had done a, he, he was in a couple bands after the Yardbirds, but he never really uh, was any, in anything famous. Armageddon was one, and Renaissance. And you said Paul Samuel Smith. Uh, I know the name. Who 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 did he produce in the seventies? Um, he produced. I know for sure Cat Stevens, the early Cat Stevens stuff, and he did other stuff. That's not at the tip of my tongue at the moment, but he stayed in the record business, and he probably did all right because he was behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And um, Jim McCarty, he he tried to stick it out with Keith Ralph. They did. They started a band together called Together. That was a little more acoustic. So Ralph and McCarty, they were more the the, the hippie yardbirds. They were more the I guess you'd call the acid takers, and they were they wanted to go in a more acoustic direction, which was not the way to go in 1967. So that's why you never heard of them much again. And then Chris Drea was the last man standing who was sticking with Page and was going to be uh, probably in Led Zeppelin, but he ended up essentially retiring from that and. Uh, Took the photo, the back photo of the first Led Zeppelin album instead. So, by the time that the Yardbirds officially were toast, uh, Clapton had been long gone. He did Cream, he then did uh, Plastic Ono Band, then Derek and the Dominoes, then basically his solo career. Um, where, how did Beck then go from uh, uh, the Yardbirds to the Jeff Beck group and beyond? Well, Jeff Beck. Strangely enough, uh, he, he had made a lot of, he, he, his fame was really in the United States. So when the Yardbirds came over with him, the, the United States fans really, I think, took to him. So before even leaving the Yardbirds, their manager was trying to, because they weren't having big hits, he was trying to figure out well, what are we going to do with this band. Maybe Keith Rolfe can do a solo single. And he actually had Jeff Beck working on a solo single. Mm -hmm. This is before he left the Yardbirds. So that was the the song um, Beck's Bolero. Yeah, and that was kind of the the step off point for Beck to then get a record deal on his own, and he formed the Jeff Beck Group in '67. Mm -hmm. So that took some time to get off the ground, and I think just Beck, I think Beck was just very immature for at that time. He was young, and it took him a while to kind of learn the business enough to even put a band a working band together. And then his album, the first the first album, Truth, I don't think that came out until, well, that came out, I guess, in 68. Yeah. It came out before the first Zeppelin album. So that was, a, at the time, kind of a groundbreaking album, even though it didn't have a hit on it. Yeah. Um, I know he was famously parodied in uh, This Is Spinal Tap by uh, the, the character, I think it was, was it Derek Smalls played by... Uh... I mean, he looks like Beck, he yeah. talks like Beck, and he he's stoned out in that movie just like Beck. I mean, I, I've seen interviews with Beck from that period. I mean, that's Derek Smalls, I think it is. Yeah, that that was definitely modeled on Jeff Beck. And I didn't know it at the time. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's totally Jeff Beck, you know. So, yeah, Beck was, um, he really had a, a longer road, uh, a longer time to kind of build up his his fame and his his work because the Jeff Beck group did well right off the bat. They only did I think two albums. Then he had a lot of changing, rotating players he played with over the next six, seven, eight years into the seventies when he really started to, for my money, uh, when he started doing those instrumental albums. That's when he really blossomed. Yeah, I, Beck Ola is another album that that's great, and uh, I always thought. Uh, if if that band had stayed together, especially with uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart had such a great rock blues voice, and he, I, I think, just wasted his career doing the, this pop. I mean, granted, it made him hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sure, but uh, uh, that was a, a real wasted opportunity to that band because I thought that the Jeff Beck group was a great band. Yeah, they just couldn't get along. I think Beck was basically the guy in charge. I think he was quick to fire people. Ronnie Wood was in that band. And yeah. I'm a big fan of Ronnie Wood's playing. He's a very talented musician. Great bass player, great rhythm player. 
And uh, it's too bad they couldn't keep those guys together because you're right. I mean, I mean, uh, <laughs> great band. So you hear all the time about lawsuits and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, so how the hell did Jimmy Page, who was the third iteration, he was lead guitarist 3.0, how did he get the rights to the name the Yardbirds to do the new Yardbirds without the other guy suing him? Did the original members have any stake uh, financially within Led Zeppelin? Well, I think the band fizzled out so badly that nobody cared. I mean, mm -hmm. at that point, Chris Drail was still in the band. So it was just the two of them, and they were going to put together a new group. And the term, I think they are already, they may have already renamed themselves Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. But I think the New Yardbirds was something they had to tour with just for a brief Scandinavian tour, to, just because I think it was contract yeah. con contracted that way. I'm not sure. It was very brief. Yeah. But, um, so, and, you know, Paige, I think he realized, I mean, I can't, let's do something new. Once he got together with the guys from Zeppelin, He's like, man, this is it. This ain't the New Yardbirds. <laughs> this is something completely different. Yeah. Um, and so throughout the 70s, I think the last iteration uh, that evolved from the Yardbirds, if I'm correct, was in 80, 81, 82, early 80s, was Box of Frogs. Is that correct? Yeah, that was kind of what I would consider like a reunion. I, I've actually never listened to that. Oh, that's pretty good. I mean, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, they had, I, what is it, Back Where I Started, I think, is, is the, the one song that charted, perhaps, in like 82, 83, whatever it was. Um, but it, it, it's classic. I mean, it, it wasn't ever going to be a big hit, but it was, for, for my money, I, I'd rather listen to that than like the Deep Purple reunion uh, with uh, Perfect Strangers kind of stuff, which to me was just sort of a homogenized version of Deep Purple at its best. Mm-hmm. So we've talked a bit about the history. Uh, I want to talk then a, a little bit about uh, uh, why, uh, a little bit more in depth, why the Yardbirds have lasted so long. So uh, when we're t can you give me an example of a song or two from uh, each of the, the main three guitarists that exemplify the band? Uh, and I also do want to talk uh, about the Little Games, which is, is the last, I guess, album uh, proper uh, and the direction they were heading towards. So with, with Clapton, what what defined the Clapton era there and what, if anything, set them apart from the Kinks or the Who or the Stones or the Beatles? Well, I would say they were very much like the Stones. The Stones at that time were uh, playing... In, in clubs playing blues, and the Yardbirds replaced them because the Stones started getting, they got the record contract and got, started getting bigger. And they didn't, ha I don't think they had a whole lot of other peers. The Pretty Things were around, they did some pretty crunchy R&B. <clears throat> but I think Clapton, the stuff that he cut his teeth on with the band was that Five Live Yardbirds album, mm -hmm. which is actually a very good album. And uh, it's, it's got a lot of energy and there's enough fast songs on it, so it doesn't sound, it's not a blues album, really. I guess it's just kind of an early blues rock album. So Clapton, uh, he also plays on the Sonny Boy Williamson album. This is the first thing they recorded. Yeah. This didn't come out so much later. And then when they needed a hit, uh, they, that was kind of gotten, they kind of hooked up with Graham Goldman through the Beatles Christmas special of 1964, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found themselves with For Your Love. So Clapton does play on For Your Love, and perhaps grudgingly so. But I think that's a great song. I think it's a great pop song, and uh, he should be proud to be on it because it, it was a, a hit, and it really started to get the Yardbirds uh, out of just the clubs and out of the pop charts and got them into America. Uh, it's interesting. Uh... I have an old Beatles album I, I've got to put away. Uh, I think they did a, an album with Sonny Boy Williamson too, uh, where they were maybe in, in the Netherlands or, or what. It, it might not be an official album, but it's one of those things that it's almost like it was a, a de rigueur for, for a young up and coming British musicians to do an album with a Howling Wolf or a Sonny Boy Williamson type. Exactly. The animals might have done something like that too. Yeah. I forgot about the Beatles doing that, but yeah, you're right about that. Um, so what then was the basic difference uh, just musically when uh, Beck came and became the lead guitarist um, 
uh, because Beck, Beck was uh, friends with Clapton. Did they have, uh, I mean, was, was Clapton already out of the band when Beck came, or did they have any clashes over the musical direction, uh, at least guitar-wise? Yeah, he was completely out. There was no overlap with Beck and Clapton. And um, as I mentioned, that uh, they initially approached Jimmy Page first to replace Clapton. So when Beck got in, it was he was a, he fit right in, and he was such a good player. There was really not a lot that he had to learn. And he, guitar playing just started to take off and get more experimental. And even though Clapton says, hey, I didn't want to go in this pop direction, if you listen, so he went on to the group uh, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers. If you listen to the guitar work he was doing in that band, he was starting to do some proto-psychedelic stuff as well there. So that was just, I think, the, the nature of the growth of guitar playing at that time. So Beck's time which is about, I think, I'd have to separate by months. I mean, roughly everybody was there about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, Beck's time there was probably, that's the time they had the most hits. Yeah. That's the most popular time. So that's Heart Full of Soul, Over and Sideways Down, and Shapes of Things. So um, the Yardbirds, when, it, when they're mentioned at all, they're kind of mentioned, I think, for those few hits that they had. And I'm a Man would be the other one that was kind of the rave up. That was kind of a, I guess, kind of the crossover between the club scenes, the club dates, uh, and the studio work. And uh, the term rave up was synonymous with the Yardbirds. And that was, in fact, one of the names of their albums, having a rave up with the Yardbirds. So Beck started to get a reputation. It was unfortunate that Clapton didn't really get to ride the coattails of the Yardbirds' success because he left a little too early. Yeah. Now... Uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, the zombies, and the zombies were were headed by Rod Argent. He was the the sort of guiding force of that band, and the Yardbirds didn't really have that. But yet, when I look, I'm looking at the the songs, uh, the ten songs that were on uh, Little Games, which I guess is the last de facto official Yardbirds album. And it looks like eight out of the ten songs were written by the Yardbirds. Most of them, uh, uh, well, McCart. Uh, Ralph McCarty and, uh, and Paige uh, uh, did most of the writing there, and it's interesting because that there there is a very uh, psychedelic feel to that too. You, I mean, something like uh, uh, well, little games there, and then you have only the black rose. Uh, that you, the, it's it's not only psychedelic, but it's almost uh, presaging what would become progressive rock in a certain way. Yeah, they they. That album has some fine moments. We're talking about little games here, yeah. uh, '67, and um, most of a lot of it's junk. But um, there are a few songs on there that they really, you could tell they had talent. They were they noticed what was going to come next, or they uh, they just their intuition was correct. And there's some nice acoustic numbers on there actually. One is um, is there a White Summer that Page transformed later with Zeppelin. Hmm. So yeah, they, they, that, they that, were, that that was also became Black Mountainside, I think, right? Like White Summer slash Black Mountainside. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Black Black Mountainside is a straight ripoff of a song called Black Waterside. Okay. That is not written by Jimmy Page, and he completely stole that publishing. Hmm. It's very it's a shame how that happened because the guy that really earned it, a guy named Bert Jansch, a really fine guitar player. Uh, Zeppelin got so big that they, they couldn't even sue Zeppelin because they were so big. Um, but anyway, um, those are the kind of influences that were getting into the art of music. And had they been able to do an album after Little Games, mm -hmm. what they did attempt to do, they recorded half of an album mm -hmm. after Little Games. And uh, that's where the song Days and Confused was recorded, mm -hmm. in the studio by the Yardbirds. Yeah, and that's that's quite different from the Led Zeppelin version. But Days and Confused was written by a guy like in '62, and it, and I think I've heard the original. It, it's very much a, a soft blues song. It does, it, it, you know, it, it it doesn't have the the drama that the Yardbirds had, and then it, the big melodrama that it became with in the Led Zeppelin version. Yeah, the the guy who wrote it is a guy named Jake Holmes, and that album came out in '66. And he was a folky in the New York era, area. And the thing about the way I would classify Dazed and Confused when it was originally done by Holmes is a folk music in the village had gotten very dark once the Beatles hit. It kind of got uh, like heroin 
dark. And that's how I view that song. A lot of another folk singer coming out of that period was a guy named Fred Neal, who was a heroin addict. And the, the folk music was getting darker and darker. So they found this song, they found him singing this song. He, he must have, I think they played on the same bill. And they, they bought the album, they learned it and transformed it. In fact, actually, the version by the Yardbirds is identical to the one Zeppelin does. The arrangement is exactly the same. Yeah. Down to the solo page plays. But what the Yardbirds did was they changed the words. Yeah. And they called it, I'm confused. Huh. So they, they so when Zeppelin did it, they went back to the original lyrics uh, that Jake Holmes wrote, and it was retitled, the original title, which was Days of well, that's sort of like with Stroll On is basically just another version of Train Kept a Rolling. Yeah, that what they had to do because the film, to put that song out, and it was a, there was some conflict with publishing that they couldn't put it on that label. Mm -hmm. So that they that was the reason they had to make that change to the lyrics and, you know, appropriate a, another song, essentially. Yeah, when, when we talked about the Naz uh, earlier this year, their third album was basically a lot of things that they had recorded and just put put on there. And I'm looking at uh, apparently in 1992 there was uh, a version of Little Games that was released with 32 songs. Was that the extra ha album? No, actually it was not. No, that is called so that Little Games double CD set that came out was a called Little Games Sessions. So it's basically there's a bunch of outtakes, some instrumental backings, uh, a couple songs by. The Keith Ralph Jim McCarty duo together. It's just a hodgepodge of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a failed single that they tried to do called uh, "You Stole My Love." Mm -hmm. That's also in this, just an instrumental. They never laid down the vocal. So that's a that I did buy that. I was real excited to get that. But there were actually songs recorded even after that for mm -hmm. the follow-up album that never was finished. So. Um... What what would you say is the most interesting or the best song in in when when Paige was the the single guitarist there? I mean, and how did it differ from uh, both the Clapton and Beck best? Well, I, I'd have to say it's a, the the song I would choose would be Happenings Ten Years Time Ago, which is with Beck. Mm. That's probably the best song Paige played on. Um, let's see here, the Little Games album, the song I like. Yeah, uh, I really like the song Puzzles. That was a self pen song by the band. And it's a great rock song. It's got some great guitar in it. Uh, Little Games has got some nice psychedelic slide guitar in it as well. I don't know if it's, he's not playing slide, but it's just distorted anyway. It sounds like a slide. And um, those would be the best songs that I think Paige contributed to the Yardbirds. And it's important. So um, where do you think, had uh, the band somehow stayed together, where do you think they would have gone? Um, you know, I mentioned uh, the Zombies before, and uh, when they broke up, uh, Rod Argent and uh, I forget who else, one of the other fellows from the band formed Argent. And if you listen to Argent, they have quite a bit different of, of a sound than the Zombies did. The Zombies were more uh, into the harmonies, whereas Argent was sort of getting into the... the Whatever the uh, whatever the synthesizer kind of stuff uh, early on in the early seventies. Um, do you think that uh, if the Yardbirds had uh, stayed together and uh, Page hadn't been able to go form Led Zeppelin, um, do you think they would have gone in a Zeppelin esque direction, or would would something else have happened? Do you think? No, I think they they wouldn't have been able to done anything like that because they were all going in different directions. Uh, uh, Page wanted to go in a heavier direction, mm -hmm. and Uncle McCarty wanted to go in an acoustic direction. Mm. We know who the right one was, you know what I mean? Mm. So I don't, they couldn't have done another album. They tried to do another album, it just, it didn't even get finished. So that album has the song Days Confused on it, and it actually has another song that's a little quieter, it's a kind of a flamenco guitar piece mm. that's played by Jimmy Page, and Jim McCarty recites some lyrics over it. It's kind of interesting. It fits with the times. But I think that um, the only way the Yardbirds would have worked beyond what it did is if Jeff Beck had stayed with them. That would have meant they would have had to go in a heavier direction, and um, Ralph would have had to go along with it. Uh, 
so um, if we talk about uh, the influence uh, that the band had going forward, um, where do you think, uh, if the Yardbirds hadn't existed, uh, do you think that hard rock, heavy metal uh, would have gone in a different direction? Were there any other groups that were going in the same direction? Because uh, when people talk about history, for example, the idea of uh, is it is it the great man theory or is it the the trend that's going? It, you know, history has its own sort of trends. Um, musically speaking, in the mid to late '60s, um, was was music you think sort of destined to go to that arena rock? Yeah, it was destined for that. And I one thing I've learned about music in general, as far as trends go in music scenes, is that it's never just one person that changes everything. It's usually the people that are leading the very finest artists are already kind of going in that direction. Somebody might get credit for getting there first, but if there was no Yardbirds, I think that we would have probably had something similar happen anyway, because the progression of 60s rock just got louder and the guitars became more pronounced and the whole idea of a guitar hero was the thing and to fill that space in an outdoor concert the guitar became the thing to do that so i think it would have happened without the yardbirds but obviously they were a huge part of it because the john mayo's blues breakers really took off after that and obviously cream and then zeppelin the jeff beck group and everybody kind of followed their lead um so which if you were to pick, say, the top three singles and which was the best album of theirs uh, for, for someone, especially someone who's just coming to the band, which, which three songs and which of the albums would you recommend? Well, the three songs, I would just go with the three most popular songs because I think those are the songs people will know and that will get them introduced to the band. And that would be For Your Love, Heart Full of Soul, and Shapes of Things. And then I would also throw in probably under under over sideways down, yeah. no over under sideways down, and happening ten years time ago. Yeah. Um, but I, if I if you ask me, well Matt, where would you send somebody to get the best yard result? I'd, I'd have them get a best sell album first, because I think that most of and they could kind of decide why I like this period the best. Probably the most unified album is Five Live Yardbirds, which is the very first album. Yeah. And then the other album that's quite good is the American version. It's called Having a Rave Up with the Yardbirds. Mm. And this album is it's half live, half studio. So it's got two hits on it, Heartful of Soul and I'm a Man. And then it has um, some live stuff. <clears throat> and it was, it's like 40 minutes worth of music on one album, which is very unusual for a 60s album. So you get a lot of bang for your buck with this one. And that's what American audiences were kind of feasting themselves on when these guys hit the scene. Yeah, one of the things uh, about uh, like uh, the Roger the Engineer, uh, some some of the stuff, as you said, is weak. But things like uh, you get these just weird upwellers, like the Hot House of Omagara shit. Uh, that's there's that little sort of bridge section. Uh, I think it's under in uh, over under sideways down where someone is talking the backgrounds to someone about a girl's vagina or something <laughs> yeah there are some good moments on this album um you know uh the nas are blue is one i've always liked and where, which comes from the, uh, that's where the nas got their, their that's where the nas got the name from you're right. right um and then there's some somewhat psychedelic stuff on this record too like yeah. one of the songs they did in 65 there was uh, a surprise hit was the song Still I'm Sad, which was kind of almost like a Gregorian chant, which was yeah. very strange for a single. And they did something a little bit like that on Roger the Engineer called uh, Turn Into Earth, which is it's getting into a little bit of that psychedelic period. So it seems like they were willing and ready to go in that direction. But again, they just had bad management. They didn't have a producer that really took care of them. Um, they had, um, you know, they fired a couple managers during the, their time. So, you know, it was always kind of a, kind of a going off the rails at some point. Yeah, they, they didn't, it, 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 for me, if they had someone like a, a Brian Epstein or a Peter Grant, uh, 
someone even outside the band, just in the management that had a, a focus, uh, uh, you know, they, they could have been, uh, you know, a lot more successful financially uh, and, and even at the time culturally, I think, musically. Yeah, they did hire Peter Grant in 68. And had they been able to hire Grant or somebody like him in 1965 when Clapton left, we might have had a completely different band. Mm. And um, I don't know what Peter Grant was doing before that, but they, they were just, I mean, management of 60s bands at that time was just hit or miss. And most managers were horrible. Mm. I mean, you find me a band that said they had a great manager. Think, can you think of one? Mm. I mean, the Beatles would be one, um, <laughs> but he ended up dying in the middle of their, uh, their, their greatest success. But yeah, I mean, management was usually horrible. And they probably lost more money for the bands that they made for them. So as we wrap this up, let me just ask you two final things then. Uh, one, can you tell me a fact or two about the band that few people know, whether it's about the, the making of an album, uh, the, the band's uh, management, the, whatever it might be. And then finally, uh, what is your assessment? Where do you place them in the pantheon of rock in general and 60s rock specifically? Okay, well, for, I'll answer your first question first. Uh, one thing that I, my research I found was that um, one of the great things about playing in the clubs in, in the London area in the 60s, mid-60s, was a lot of guys sat in with one another. Mm. And Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page sat in with Eric Clapton and the Blues Breakers yeah. one night, which surprised, unfortunately nobody has recorded, but I thought that was really cool. So that's a tidbit that I didn't even know about uh, until I did some research. And um, to answer your other question, um, where do they find? Where do I find them in the overall pantheon? Well, if you just talk musically, the, or just what their output was, it's not that impressive compared to a lot of other British '60s groups like the Animals or the Zombies or the Kings. So it's relatively on par with them. Mm. But um, the Pantheon always focuses on the guitar players and the success that they had later. Yeah. That's where the, unfortunately, that's where the, where the story's always been told. And that's why the story of the Yardbirds for many years was not told very well, because they weren't really focusing on band years, but more on the individual guitar players that came from there. Mm -hmm. But I think that the Yardbirds are one important band, and uh, it basically because they were the, the band that transformed the Chicago blues into blues rock, and that took off in a huge way. And uh, basically the Brits had to do that, to play our, the United States music back to us. We didn't really understand it until these British young white guys played it back, sped up, you know, and the Yardbirds were one of the first to really do that. Mm -hmm. And they were the first, one of the first rock bands to really do a lot of improvisation. So I think for, as a live band, they were always considered to be an excellent band. And for their improvisation, I think they've always were hugely respected. Yeah, I, I saw something recently on YouTube about uh, there was a, a show in the mid 60s. I forget the name of it. Uh, it wasn't Top of the Pops, but where they'd have black blues people. Uh, blues makers playing with young British bands and there was one supposedly very famous incident a, 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 a female, black female guitarist uh, from the 30s or 40s uh, ended up playing, I forget who it was, it might have been the Animals um, uh, but there was nothing like that in America you had American Bandstand Yeah, I mean the uh, the black music of America was it was, you know, Mississippi Delta or it was like CD uh, Chicago clubs. It wasn't. There weren't a lot of. Um, there was obviously white fans in the states, mm -hmm. but it was so separate. You know, I mean, and and I don't mean that as a segregation type of thing, but the music was just very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at early '60s pop versus Sonny Boy Williams, I mean, it's like worlds apart. And so, and and, and since you're a. a a Beatles aficionado. I, it just came to mind as you were mentioning uh, something a couple of minutes ago. Um, I, I also saw on the internet too a, a rumor that a, a famous track supposedly uh, 
played by George Harrison, was actually played by Jimmy Page. Do you know anything about it? I forget which song it was, but apparently uh, uh, Page sat in on a session for, in one of the Beatles tracks, uh, and some people have claimed that it was Page playing lead guitar and not Harrison. Do you know anything about that? Uh, what track? That's not true. No? Okay. No, no. Page never sat in with the Beatles. No? Okay. Uh, well, uh, Matt, uh, all is good to talk to you. I will link to uh, uh, Pop Go the Sixties uh, YouTube channel, uh, uh, and also if you, is your website actually up now? Or is it in the process? Of... The website is up, okay, and uh, it's not doesn't have a lot on it, but uh, you can you can get to my YouTube channel through the website. There's a newsletter you can sign up for. I'm going to have some merchandise coming soon, so I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to it lately. So have a look if you get a chance. Well, thanks, thanks again, Matt. Thank you, Dan.